Okay. Yep. Hang on, we're being recorded. Right, good evening, everybody, and Happy New Year, I suppose, from everybody in Yorkshire Branch Committee. I hope you've had a great Christmas, and I hope you have a particularly happy and very healthy New Year. For the first time ever, we have a capacity audience. So if you can all make sure that you're muted, uh, don't let me force to uh, Nick to shout at you. Um, secondly, if you have any questions either during the talk or after the talk, please will you use the chat fun function. Uh, I think you'll, everybody will find this easier and uh, uh, the best system we can have for this. And um, now, without any further ado, let me introduce Dennis Dell. Dennis joined Butterfly Conservation in 1976. So a couple of seconds while we worked that out, 1976. And uh, he spent 22 years in Switzerland in the, in the intervening years, continued to be a, a branch member of Butterfly Conservation. He's lived in Buckinghamshire. He remains a member of the Upper Thames branch. And he was, he was species champion for the Upper Thames branch. He moved to Sheffield at the end of 2017. He joined East Midland, he joined Yorkshire, and he joined Lincolnshire branches. Dennis, thank you. Um, his obsession with Purple Emperor dates back from 1978. He saw the species for the first time in an Oxfordshire wood. Um, he bred in Switzerland uh, Purple Emperor from eggs and larvae, releasing the adults back into the woods. Um, where he had found them in their early stages. And his main interest now is monitoring the northern spread. So, uh, like him, like the rest of us, we are looking forward to seeing it in, in Yorkshire. And without any further ado, take it away, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Hello, everybody, and thank you very much for joining this evening. I'd like to straight away thank Martin and the committee for inviting me in the first place and Nick and Paul for arranging the technical aspects of the meeting. Um, as, as Paul said, I, I'm a great joiner. I like joining because that's the way to get to know people of similar interests. So I'd also like to mention people in the East Midlands branch, living in Sheffield, of course, on the Derbyshire border. I spend, um, I'm ashamed today, more time in Nottinghamshire and Derbyshire than I do in Yorkshire. Uh, please don't punish me for that. So I'd like to mention um, Jane Broomhill, uh, Susan Halfacre, Stephen Mathers, and Ken Orp of the East Midlands branch, who've helped me a lot. Um, they take me to, to new habitats, which I've never seen before, and advise me where to go and what to look for. So I'm very grateful to you all for helping me settle in, and I'm delighted to be here. So the structure of my talk is as follows. Um, I will tell you about the distribution of the Purple Emperor, which I shall refer to as Iris from now on for the sake of brevity, the national distribution from 1945, and then I will go on to the distribution which interests us most of all um, from North and Northamptonshire northwards. And then I'll look, and this is the most important thing for those who don't have much experience of this species, I'll talk about strategies for looking for and finding the purple emperor and including behavior and special idiosyncratic habits which will help you to locate the purple emperor so there's that's how the talk is divided so um it's important for me this first slide because i guess all if not many of you know matthew oates know of matthew oates um he is the national expert of the Purple Emperor, butterflies generally. He worked for the National Trust as conservation officer many years, managing the habitats, and he knows more about the Purple Emperor than anybody in the country. Um, and he's written a lot of books. This is his latest book, which I guess many of you have read uh, and know about. Those, are the, those of you that haven't should get this book. Um, it describes the ecology of the species in great detail. And everything I'm going to say to you tonight is in his book in more detail than I can tell you. The only thing that I can tell you 
that's not in his book is the details of the Northern movement in the last three years. So next slide, please. So first distribution map, sorry, um, quickly a uh, picture of the bug bar. You're all familiar with it. I only put this here because to my eyes, it looks blue. And when I show pictures of the Purple Emperor to people who don't know it, um, they will say, why do you call it the Purple Emperor? It's blue. And it does, uh, color is very subjective, as you know. So to some people's eyes, this looks purple. To some people's eyes, it looks blue. But of course, uh, the blue emperor does not sound half as grand as the purple emperor. Next slide, please. So the first distribution map, national distribution map, which I have, um, dates back to 1945 from Professor Ford's classic book called Butterflies. And it's not very easy to see, but I hope you can see the two kilometer distribution circles um, from the southern coast, the central southern counties of Dorset, Hampshire and Sussex, up through the Thames Valley, Wiltshire, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire, and up level with the Wash, which corresponds to the south of Lincolnshire and a couple of places in East Anglia um, and more and very interestingly um, in, in the Welsh border counties, quite a few distribution there and a couple in Devon and Somerset. So that's how it looked in 1945, pretty restricted to the southern and south Midlands counties in the centre of the country and, the Wel and some Welsh border counties. Next slide, please. Um, this map looks very similar, and it's not surprising because it's only uh, the next five years, 45 to 50, and it's easier to see because the distribution is blocked out, as you can see. And it's from Notes and Views of the Purple Emperor. Many of you uh, are familiar with this book. It's the first book ever written, restricted, which only talks about the Purple Emperor, an excellent book. Um, I think published first in the 1960s. Um, and you can see a similar distribution, some slight differences. You can see easily um, that it's um, over the southern counties. Uh, that's Hampshire, Sussex, Dorset. And then you go up north through Wiltshire, Berkshire, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire. And the slight differences appears to extend a little bit further north. And this is a well-kept secret. Um, it's been in uh, the South Link, some South Lincolnshire woods for a long time, according to historical records, but it's not widely known, except perhaps to Lincolnshire folks. So between about Grantham and the border with Rutland, um, the Purple Emperor can be seen in several woods. So that really is the most northerly um, known habitat way back, way back to the 1940s. And you still see a distribution in the Welsh border counties and something in East Anglia and a little bit in Kent. And interestingly, uh, the northern half of the Isle of Wight. So next slide, please. And now um, I'm afraid I have big gaps in these distribution maps. I haven't been able to fill in these gaps here, but um, the previous one was to 1950. And this one is from 1970. So we got a 20 year gap when I don't know what was happening, but you see a huge difference here, don't you? I mean, um, there's a big uh, diminution in the distribution. You no longer see it in East Anglia. Uh, you no longer see it in the Welsh border counties, except for one two kilometer square. And you have a few sites in Devon and Somerset, but the main concentration as recorded in those days, 1970 to 1982, the purple two millimeter circles uh, are in mainly Sussex. And Sussex has always been the major county for the Purple Emperor, and it still is. That's the place to go if you really want to see quite a few Purple Emperors. So it's, it's, you can see that it's in Dorset, Hampshire, Sussex. It hardly gets into Kent and a little way up into the Thames Valley, Wiltshire certainly, and, and Oxfordshire, Berkshire and Buckinghamshire. Um, what's interesting in this map, the orange circles uh, showing you the most northerly point, 
They correspond to the famous firm in wood, Rockingham Forest. Now, um, you may have heard of somebody called Dennis Watkins Pitchford, BB for short. He was a famous entomologist in Northamptonshire and he bred the purple emperor. There were historical records from Fermian Woods from way back, but um, there weren't many to be seen in the 19, in, in this period. And he started breeding and introducing it back into Fermian Wood during the eighties. And he was very successful, very successful indeed. Um, so much so that the authorities decided to include um, those distributions. You know, the authorities are not very keen on indicating on their maps um, areas where the but any butterfly has been introduced. They don't like it. But if it has become really established and successfully established, then they will include it. So um, those orange spots correspond to 1995 to 1999. And the Purple Emperor first started being seen in Fermin Woods in the early 90s. And it's one of the best places to go. Um, no doubt many of you, I know quite a few of you have been to Fermin Woods. It's quite a long trip, but it's worth it because it's, it's a very good site. But you can see a very restricted distribution there. So if you move to the next slide, please, Nick. And now we see a difference. Again, there's a big jump, unfortunately. I don't have um, distribution maps in between, but now we're getting really up to date. This is 2008 to 2017. I've taken this map from a very good recent publication by Peter Eels called The Life Cycle of British, Butterf of British and Irish Butterflies. And here you see an interesting difference. Here you see a definite spread, an increase in the number a big increase in the number of two kilometer squares uh, in an easterly direction. You see that the species is going into the eastern home counties, particularly Essex, Hertfordshire, and a few more in East Anglia. And um, that northerly, most northerly point that you see now is actually South Nottinghamshire, it's Cockgrave Wood. Now, that's an interesting one because there are historical records from Cockgrave Wood in Nottinghamshire going way back, um, but they're not, they're not really confirmed. A lot of it is hearsay, um, but in the last five to seven years, it is being seen in reasonable numbers in Cockgrave Wood. I try to go there and I see it there and other people too. So. Cockgrave Wood in South Nottinghamshire about five to seven years ago, people got very excited about that because I didn't know it was there. I didn't know it was in Nottinghamshire at all. And um, we were very excited to, to note that it, it's definitely, it was definitely in Nottinghamshire at least five to seven years ago. Um, the other um, distributions just to the southeast of that are the existing South Lincolnshire distributions and Rutland. And then just to the west there, to the southwest of Cockgrave, you see some new distributions. They are Warwickshire. Um, whether it was always in Warwickshire, we don't know, but it was successfully introduced there and there are stable populations. Now, there's a lot of discussion amongst all of us all the time about when we see an increased distribution like this, uh, we don't know for sure, is it due to increase observer observation? To what extent is it due to increase observer observation? And to what extent is it due to a real increase in the number of the butterfly and the increase in the spread of it? You know, you can't answer this for definite. I believe that it's mainly due to an increased distribution in the case of iris. And I have a personal reason, reason for saying that, namely, um, when we first lived in Buckinghamshire from in, in the 70s, I started doing transects in, in a series of woods there, which were very good for the black hair streak and the white admiral. So, and all, all the ingredients were there for, the, for iris, lots of sallow, very important. But I, in, in six to seven years of looking, um, I never saw a single iris, although way back there were some historical records, but I never saw an arbit of thought spending hundreds of hours in these woods over a period of seven years. If it was there, I would have seen it. 
So off we go to Switzerland for 22 years from 1981 to 2002. I come back, we live in Aylesbury again in Buckinghamshire. I go back to these woods and I see iris without any trouble. At first, maybe half a dozen specimens at the height of the season per day, but going from none 20 years ago to several, and then in very good years in the mid 2000s, 2013 to 2018, which were bumper years over the whole country, um, I, on, on three occasions, I saw 30 iris with a friend in two hours um, in, two, in, in, in that period of time where I had seen none 20 years ago. Um, so I'm sure that we, we were seeing an increase in the distribution. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're focusing on our area, if you like. If you, as Yorkshire men, want to include our area as um, Northamptonshire and Leicestershire, if you agree to that. Um, but what I've done, or how I think about it, I think of Fermin Wood as an established uh, northerly um, place where you can see iris commonly. That's, that's the southernmost spot near Corby in, in Northamptonshire. And then I go north from there. And what we see, we see Cockgrave Wood. Um, I've marked it just south of Nottingham, an established locality, certainly in the last seven years. Um, and we see a bigger purple blotch um, by Melton Mowbray. Um, that corresponds to the South Lincolnshire localities. Um, and we see, uh, there's a mistake, by the way, I have to point out to you that where I, those that most northerly habitat, just south of Worksop, um, Wellow Park Woods, that's wrong. It should be placed between Mansfield and Newark-on-Trent. Wellow Park Wood is between Mansfield and Newark-on-Trent, Newark um, south of Sherwood Forest. And that is a, an established habitat. So what I want to say is that there have been two established woods, Cockgrave Wood and Willow Park Wood in Nottinghamshire, where it's been seen for some years. Um, and, and the South Lincolnshire habitat. All the other points are new localities. No, let's, we, let's keep on this one. So the most exciting find is to the left of this slide, um, that square blotch just northwest of Leicester, the city of Leicester. Um, the Leicestershire colleagues are very excited because in the last three to four years, they've been seeing the purple emperor in several locations in the national forest just northwest of Leicester. And this is possibly, this really got us going and made us think, well, it really is moving north. It's not an isolated colony. As you'll see, there are several in that, in that part of Leicestershire. So let's sit, have a look at the next slide, please. See, I'm homing in on this area, uh, the southeastern edge of the National Forest. Uh, the city of Leicester is in the bottom right hand corner of this slide. And what you see, the, the red diamonds, five localities. These are five localities in, within the area of Charnwood Forest, where Iris has been seen in the last three or four years by several people. And um, what's, what's important about this is you've not got an isolated new colony here. You've got five separate colonies, all within a few miles of each other, indicating quite strongly that you have a real spread of iris to a new region. Thank you, next slide, please. And here you see a picture of the National Forest running from the city of Leicester in a northwesterly direction to the Derbyshire border. Um, it's about 40, uh, about 50 kilometres from east to west and 10 to 20 kilometres um, from south to north. It's quite a sizable area. And what I would like you to notice in particular is the large number of woodlands within this area and close together too. And this is what's so important for Iris if, if we would like to see it spreading. Um, several of us have seen female purple emperors leave, leave a wood where they've been ovipositing and fly very decisively out of the wood, um, quite close to the ground. And what they're doing is they're 
they're wanting to spread their progeny. This is normal, this is what you would expect. And they're making for the next nearest wood where they hope they will find sallow. And what's very beneficial here uh, in the national forest is that these woods are so close together. There's absolutely not, not gonna be any problem in female iris going from wood to wood and spread, spreading her progeny. At the moment, the main concentration is at the southeastern end, um, but um, other folk in Leicestershire have been seeing it in woods around Ashby de la Zouche in the middle of the area. So this is very promising. And I know Ken Orp of Derbyshire is very keen to see it in his county very soon. You see Burton on Trent in the Northwest there, that's in Derbyshire, isn't it? So I'm sure we'll see it in Derbyshire soon. Next slide, please. Okay, so I am very grateful to Stephen Mathers, the new Nottinghamshire recorder, and Ken Orp, the Derbyshire recorder, for producing this distribution map for me. It's showing you in more detail, if you like, the distribution um, up to 2021 in Nottinghamshire, Leicestershire and Derbyshire, including Rutland. You don't see any in Derbyshire yet, but you can see very well in the northwest of Leicestershire, the distribution, and that's the national forest there, those five two kilometre circles, very nice. Um, and then further away to the east and southeast, that's, uh, they're the known localities in Rutland. It's been recorded in Rutland for some years. And then um, just to the northeast there, that's on the um, Leicestershire, Lincolnshire Derby, that, uh, sorry, Leicestershire, Lincolnshire um, border, where it has been seen for some years. Perhaps the most exciting distribution is Nottinghamshire. Um, Cotgrave wood is the most southerly wood, and um, Wellow Park wood is just to the southeast of those four, um, four spots. That's it. Well done, Wellow Park wood. So that, that are the existing woods, if you like, where Iris has been known for five to seven years. Everything else is new in the last few years. This is really exciting. You can see one, two, three, four, five, eight, nine, ten new localities. In the east, those two, they're around Newark. It's been seen around Newark for the last two or three years. Um, and the others are all new localities from the last few years. Now, at this point, I want to um, talk about Sherwood Forest, those three localities. Um, Matthew's, in Matthew's book, he talks about iris in every county in England, historical records. He does it very well. And uh, when you look at Nottinghamshire, uh, in his book, you will find, for instance, Wellow Park, Wood is mentioned, woods around Mansfield are mentioned, um, just to the west and southwest of um, Sherwood Forest, very close. Um, and he mentions records just before the Second World War, which is a long time ago. But Jane Broomhead, the Nottinghamshire organiser, tells me that she knows of records, official records from Sherwood Forest in the 1980s. But it's a, that's a long time ago, and we have nothing since then. And then um, I have to mention Nick and Samantha Brownlee, who might, might, might be here tonight, I don't know. Um, they are or were mainly birders. And I've, I'm known from my experience that birders are very good butterfly spotters as well, if you can get them interested. And they do get interested, and they're very good. So Nick, a birder, in early in July 2020, not long ago at all, was cycling through the northern end of Sherwood Forest, uh, Budby South Forest, I think it's called, and he saw this butterfly on the ground. He didn't identify himself exactly, thought it might be a purple ember, but he didn't know enough about it. It only had one wing. Now, um, I don't know if you remember, but the end of June 2021, there were very severe storms and the Purple Emperor um, does get damaged in high winds and high storms, and its wings can be knocked off. And I think this is probably what happened to this specimen. So Nick picked it up the ground, had the presence of mind to photograph it in his hand, this one wing Purple Emperor. He also had the presence of mind to send it to iRecord, who require very good um, confirmation of a record. Um, they, they require a photo, as you probably know. And he also told the Knox recorder of the time, 
Susan Halfacre about the record. And because this is one of the things I do, I make sure that people know about me. Um, she knew about me and my interests, and she immediately told me about this record. And I was very excited, as you can imagine, because that definitely represented the most northerly record um, that uh, anybody had. Uh, it's, um, it's actually on the same latitude, more or less, as Chambers Farmwood, a very famous locality, which I guess many of you know about. Um, but this is an introduced um, colony in Chambers Farmwood, Lincolnshire, um, successfully introduced by the late Martin White, um, who did a lot of introduction work, um, which didn't always go down well with the authorities, but he, he was a very experienced man. It's very sad that he died young, but he, he introduced the Purple Emperor to Chambers Farmwood, Lincolnshire, and there's a very, very good colony. In fact, I would tell you all that this is the best, nearest place for you Yorkshire folk to go and find a Purple Emperor in good numbers. On, on a good day, you will see 20 in Chambers Farmwood, no problem. Um, and it's on the same la latitude as Sherwood Forest. And last year, we had an even more northerly record about a mile north of um, Budby South Forest, still part of the Sherwood Forest complex, I would say. And the person got a photograph of a purple emperor up there. And uh, I go back to Nick and Sam Brownlee. They saw the butterfly. I contacted them. I've been in constant contact with them ever since. And they're doing tremendous work. They've really got, um, got the Purple Emperor bug, as people tend to do when they see one. So they've been back frequently. They live in Mansfield. They, have, they discovered young larvae there in 2020, which we all went to see. They found quite a lot of larvae in that area, and they've been following the larvae through the winter and the butterflies last summer. And they're following hibernating larvae, which is a tremendously difficult task because they're so well camouflaged during the winter, but they've been following them. So they really got the bug. Um, I think they're still interested in birds, but I think they might be more interested in the Purple Emperor. And it's wonderful to have them. I, I'm very lucky. It's, it's an extraordinary thing that's happened to me because when I was in Upper Thames, there was a couple called Wendy and Mick Campbell who were uh, just like Nick and Samantha Brownlee. They were very keen. And they went out in the winter, they found new localities. And I come up here and I'm sad, I was sad to leave Upper Thames and sad to leave Mick and Wendy Campbell be fine. But what happens? I find another couple, Nick and Samantha Brownie, who are equally keen. So I'm, I'm very lucky because I, um, I can't get around so much these days. So it's good to have um, people like that who are so keen and looking. And what's more, uh, the RSPB are very active in Sherwood Forest. We've got them interested as well. And uh, they go out looking. And the best record we have from last summer from RSPB volunteers is that they saw four purple emperors in that part of Sherwood Forest last July. So it's, it's looking pretty good. If you look at the map of Nottinghamshire, um, an aerial Google map or a Northern Survey map, you will see that from just north of Nottingham, the city of Nottingham, right up to the Yorkshire border and beyond, it's continuous woodland, absolutely continuous woodland all the way. So this is absolutely ideal situation for the Purple Emperor to spread. And I'm really hoping that some of you folk will see the Purple Emperor in South Yorkshire, just over the border in the not too distant future. Next slide, please. Okay, um, some of you may have heard of a place called NEP, spelt K-N-E-P-P. -P. It's a large estate, about 3,000 acres in Sussex. Um, many years ago, the owners of this, it was farmland, uh, Charlie Burrell is his name, um, decided that they would give up farming because that part of Sussex is apparently uh, not very economical for farming. And so they decided to rewild, as the expression goes, which is leaving their land to its own devices, but not leaving it to its own devices. Because as you know, if you do that, an area will become completely forested over, scrub will grow, it will become trees, and it will become a dense forest, which would not be very amenable to, to the butterflies. 
So what they did, they, they've gone back to a kind of medieval form of farming, um, whereby you allow cattle, certain breeds of cattle and certain breeds of pig in particular to just roam through, through the area, through the woodlands, through the scrub. And they, they, of course, graze and they keep the scrub down. They eat grass, they eat young saplings, but they don't eat everything. So what happens is you end up with a wonderful matrix, which this aerial view shows of open grassland, scrub, small, small patches of woodland. And as I told you, Sussex is the epicenter, the mega center of the purple emperor population in this country. And the woods all around NEP um, have purple emperor. And so they quickly um, occupied this area and it's become an extraordinary place, place to go to. It, the numbers you see there uh, are beyond the imagination. When I used to first see the Purple Ember, if I saw six to 12 on a good day in July in an Oxfordshire or Buckinghamshire wood, I'd be very happy. Um, that was in the early days. Um, as time went on, when I came back from Switzerland, on a couple of occasions, I saw 30 with a friend in two hours in my best Buckinghamshire wood. And that was terrific. But when I tell you about the numbers that Matthew Oates and his friend Neil Hume see here, and what they do is they live in NEP for more or less the whole of July. They must have very understanding wives, but they actually camp out in NEP and they spend every day looking for the Purple Emperor. Um, the last two years have been so good, but up to about 2018, um, they were seeing 300 purple emperors in a day, three to 400 purple emperors in a day in high season. It's quite extraordinary. Um, it became the commonest butterfly at one time. I visited once um, in late June 2018, a good season, and I, I, I came from train from Sheffield. Matthew picked me up. We spent an afternoon there. Uh, two or three hours and the following morning I stayed there before going back to Sheffield so I had about uh, four to five hours there and we saw 120 purple emperors quite extraordinary so if you have the time to make the pil pilgrimage to NEP um, it's well worthwhile. Um, moving on to the next slide please. So um, this is how I look for the Purple Emperor. So when we got back from Switzerland, I went back to my woods that I knew from 20 years ago. And what we look for is woods with high points, preferably, ideally. And you can see from the contours here, from north, um, from the north, the top edge of the slide going in a southerly direction, you see the contours very close together going through Great Sea Wood. Uh, further down and then doing a sharp right hand turn at Finnemere House um, at the top edge of Finnemere Wood going to east and the highest point in this area is in the middle of these woods 129 meters in in the farmland there and the lowest point is to the west I think 80 meters the contour shows but what I used to do um, routinely was enter at the top of the north of uh, the north top left hand corner of the slide, that bridle way there, I used to walk down through Roma Wood to Great Sea Wood. And as you can see, it gets steeper and steeper until you reach the edge, the southeastern edge of Great Sea Wood. And it's known, it's well known, that the male purple emperor um, makes for the high point in woods. Um, it uses that as territory, and that's the best place to spot it. I did see it along the bridle way, all the way along, but the best place was when I parked myself at A, which was about 50 meters outside the wood and looked along through binoculars, you must have binoculars with you, along the edge of the wood. Um, you see, you have the best chance of, of spotting one if, if they're there because you're at the high point that they like to congregate at and you have a, a nice vista, a wild field, a wide field of view. But you see, when you're walking through a bridleway, a ride, you're close to the trees and your field of view is only limited to the tops of the trees on either side of the ride. So your chances of seeing one are less than when you're in open ground outside the high point. So the other two high points were at B and C, where I used to stand 
uh, outside the northern edge of Finemere Wood. And if we go to the next slide, please. I'm homing in now on the northern edge of Finemere Wood. And th this is, was a kind of lesson for us. In 2003, we invited Matthew Oates to um, show us how to look for the Purple Emperor. We knew about high points, but he could tell us a lot more. We walked along the northern edge, 50 meters from the edge, and he got to this canopy gap in the ash trees there. And he, he carries this little deck chair with him. And he said, guys, we stop here. And he unfolded his little chair, sat down, folded his arms and said to us, we wait here and we'll see a purple emperor fly across the, that canopy gap. And sure enough, after two minutes, a purple emperor glided across that gap at the tops of the trees. And we stood there fascinated watching this happen for about half an hour. And in subsequent years, I and, and other friends spent a lot of time um, at, the, at the top edge of this wood. Next slide, please. Um, again, this is a typical how, um, what the purple emperor does, the male. Um, it will perch, it will find the, um, the highest point on an ash or oak tree. Um, forget what you read in the old books about master oaks. It, it really doesn't favor any particular tree. It, it perhaps prefers oaks and ashes most of all, but we found it on conifers, Scots pines, Corsican pines, any tree which um, dominates the landscape and, and towers above the other trees. This is not at the highest point of Finemere Wood, it's halfway up the slope, but th this is a place where I would see purple emperors and I was lucky enough to catch one perched right at the top of the oak tree. We believe what they're doing uh, when they're doing this is looking for females. That's, that's a good place to look down to the right and see females which fly, fly along at a lower trajectory. And all purple emperors are doing, they're very aggressive male purple emperors. Uh, they, will, they will fly down and, and try to mate with a female. That's all they're interested in. Um, and he stayed there a long time before a flea female came by. Next slide, please. And a friend of mine caught this great picture of a, a purple emperor flying across a canopy gap. This is in an Oxfordshire wood, Oakley wood. It's flying from a beech tree on the right to an oak tree on the left, gliding across elegantly. Next slide, please. And there he is making his landing approach. That's one of the Okay, it's not sharp, but it's, it's a delightful photo, one of the best I've seen. He's, uh, and this is what they do. They fly across a canopy gap and elegantly glide down to their, the oak leaf they want to perch on. Next slide, please. Okay, this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing, this photo. It was taken by a chap called Rob Hill down in Surrey. Now he uh, spends a lot of time in Bookham Common. Bookham Common is another um, historical place where you see purple emperors and the male as I said is very aggressive so it will find a territory at a high point in a wood by the way I, I should say that if your wood is flat um, then you should look for groups of trees which tower above the rest like poplars for instance um, the purple emperor male just needs a high point um, high trees or a high point in a wood so um, Rob managed to catch three fighting purple emperors. If a, if a male purple emperor is on territory and another male comes into his territory, he will take off and fight him. He really will. Um, they're beasts when they, when, when they get going. And he's got three here in, in his field of view, quite extraordinary. I've seen two fighting and I think I've seen three once. What happens is, is the one on his perch will take off and go after the one that's encroaching his territory. And a wonderful spiral fight will ensue where they could both go high up in the sky, um, often completely out of view. And after about 30 seconds, one will come tumbling down and occupy that very same perch. It may be the original incumbent, or it may be that the intruder has, has fought him off and, and gained the territory, but that's what they do. Next slide, please. Okay, um, now we're going on to the peculiar eating habits 
or nutritional habits of the perpendicular, but no doubt many of you will know about this already. This was taken by Matthew Oates in NEP. You see two males on a fox scat, fox poo. Um, they like excrement, as you probably know, as you probably read. That's their favorite um, food, if you like. Um, their very favorite is fox, as you see here, but they like dog as well, and, and any excrement uh, in the woodland ride, preferably fresh. Um, this is actually a video, but Nick and I have expressed I've shown you this very short video because you can hear Matthew's voice in the background and his enthusiasm comes through. But unfortunately, we couldn't manage it. But you can see two purple emperors here uh, enjoying themselves on Fox Sky. Next slide, please. Um, it's quite rare for purple emperors to nectar, take nectar, but it does happen. And this is quite an old photograph from a wood in Northamptonshire, which was sent to me. Um, it's, it was the first time I'd ever seen a photo of a purple emperor on a flower. And it's, it's quite old and it's on Selfield, that pretty little flower that grows in um, woodland rides. You can see it's feeding because it's, you can see it's yellow proboscis probing. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is extraordinary. Um, I saw this in a car park in an Oxfordshire wood. Car parks in iris woods are very good places to, to see the butterfly because it's, it's attracted to foreign objects within its territory. It's attracted to shiny car surfaces, rubber tires. Now this one had landed on the tire and I watched it as it crawled over the tire into the interior of the car. As you can see, it's on the suspension here. It's in complete darkness. So I, I took a photo with the flash. It's not a brilliant photo, but you can, you can surely see that it's a purple emperor in darkness. And he stayed there with his wings open in complete darkness for minutes on end. Extraordinary. Next slide, please. This is another thing to look out, look out for. I haven't seen it very often, but uh, Matthew sees it a lot in NEP and other people see it too. Um, it prefers excrement, but it also likes sap oozing from wounded tree branches. It, it's absolutely crazy about that. And it seems to sense where a wounded uh, branch is, where sap might be oozing and will home in on it. Now, this was taken by a friend years ago in a wood in Oxfordshire, and he told me about it. And he took this photo. You can see three purple emperors at that hole in the bark there, uh, feeding on sap oozing. There's a, there's a red admiral who's taken off, who's been chucked out of that place by the purple emperors, but commas like feeding on sap as well. He told me about it. I went there the next day and they were still there. I didn't see three, I saw two. But once they find, um, if you can find um, sap oozing from a wounded tree branch in a purple emperor wood, like as not, you'll find a purple emperor there eventually. And they'll stay there for ages. Next slide, please. This is one of my favorites. Um, purple emperors are attracted to anything foreign within their wood, which includes human beings. And I think probably all of you have seen photos of purple emperors on people. Um, and this is one such. Um, I used to lead um, Irish field meetings in an Oxfordshire wood every July. And this is one of those. And what I love about this picture is the delight on, on, on the people taking photos. Um, quite a lot of them have come from far away and they've never seen a purple emperor before. And this one landed on this chap's back, one of our members, Tony Croft. And he patiently stood there like that for at least 20 minutes, allowing everybody to get a good photo. Lovely. Next slide, please. Okay, oh, I should have given a health warning before um, showing you this slide because some people might be offended by it. And I apologize in advance if anybody is. It's, it's slightly frivolous, but it has some serious... Um, I, I discussed it with Nick, uh, how should we... I don't want to offend anybody, but he's written something for me um, from what I told him about this, and I'll read it to you. Um, and and this, is all, all the, this is everything that happened and that I experienced on the, from this. 
When researching my local home patch, I spotted there were reports from Cliveden Manor. Now, Cliveden Manor is a National Trust property, beautiful house surrounded by woodland in, in Maidenhead in Berkshire by the River Thames. Um, now, one of our um, lady members of the Upper Thames branch is a member of an exclusive uh, private swimming club there. And she was there and she's all purple emperor by, by the side of the pool, which was um, very interesting. Um, it does that sort of thing, it seeks water out and, and the whole area is known to be a purple emperor habitat and it's heavily wooded. So it's no great surprise, but, what, um, but what's interesting about this is, that, is the historical connection. Now, you have to be, some of you have to be of a certain age to know who Christine Keeler was. Um, I won't go into the history of it, but um, she basically caused the downfall of the British government and the empire almost in 1963, when she cavorted with politicians, aristocrats and Russian spies. It was one of the biggest scandals, um, post-war scandals ever. And um, <laughs> the, um, he won't mind me saying this, but the chairman of Upper Thames Branch, Nick Bowles, um, he had this photo and we discussed it and he imposed this uh, purple emperor on the back of Christine Keeler, which I think is delightful. Of course, it's out of proportion. That's a rather giant, giant purple emperor, but, but that's lovely. But the purple emperor was really, really was there where Christine Keeler was. Next slide, please. Okay, um, we talked about this. But he, this one is on a finger, but you can see his proboscis is actually underneath a rather dirty fingernail. I don't know whose it was, I hope it wasn't mine, but um, it likes anything which is a bit dirty. It obviously tastes better. Next slide, please. Um, it's on the ground. Um, you'll see the male perpramper come to ground, uh, often during the morning, um, at the beginning of its life and you'll see it's proboscis owl probing the stones and dry surface. Um, we think it's imbibing salts and minerals from the surface of the ride. And uh, it's, only, it's only hypothetical, but we think, or people think that he's, what he's doing here is building up his strength uh, by imbibing minerals prior to mating. Um, the other interesting thing about this picture is that it's typical, in other words, Unlike that very first slide I showed you, it's not easy to get a photo seeing the purple on both wings. It depends upon the angle you're looking at the, the butterfly from, and it depends, depends upon the angle of the sun's rays, how they hit the wings and how they're reflected from the scales. But this is very typical, seeing purple on one side and brown on the other. Next slide, please. Um, again, um, you're perplexed. You see the purple emperor landing on all sorts of surfaces. You can understand, you understand he gets nutrition from the ride surface, from poo, from people's sweat on their skin, the minerals in sweat. But you know, what's he doing here? This is my boot, my walking boot. It's been waxed. Is it deriving um, nutritional benefit from the wax? It's extraordinary. Next slide, please. This was in Switzerland many years ago. I was walking through one of my woods and there was a pile of wood shavings and there were two male purple emperors um, intent on getting something out of the wood shavings. You can see the proboscis of the, um, the one on the right quite clearly, it's probing the surface. I think what's happening here, any organic material lying around in the open exposed to the sun and moisture will decay, it will ferment, wood will ferment slowly, of course. And I, th I think that's probably what's happening here. But when, the, when they find something they like like this, um, from which they're getting nutritional benefit, they'll stay there ages. I, I watched them for a few minutes and I went off into the wood doing my thing. I came back an hour later and they were still there, quite extraordinary. Next slide, please. Okay, uh, on a tie, you've seen me tell the story of walking around a tire to the interior of the car. This was in a car park. You know, some people, lazy people, would go to this particular car park of this Irish wood, Irish wood in Watfordshire, and they wouldn't leave the car park or their cars some because 
the Purple Emperor would come into the car park, land on the cars, and all they were interested in was getting nice photos. But okay, good luck to them. Next slide, please. So this one is not, um, is, is not on a wounded tree trunk or wounded branch. There's no wound here. There's no sap oozing. But early in the morning, of course, you've got a collection of dew on trees, which runs down the crevices in the bark. And this male purple ember is clearly slaking his, th his thirst on, on the tiny rivulets of water running down. That happens early in the morning. Next slide, please. Okay, this is, if you like, the last iris slide, and it's a rather sad one, but sadly typical. This is uh, on a road um, in Switzerland through a wood that I used to go to. Um, and they, they like hot road surfaces, the termac, the tarmac, the melting tarmac, the stones, and they will land on the road and imbibe the salts and of course get run over um, quite often, which is what happened, what happened here. Now then, how are we doing for time? Paul and Nick. You've had 50 minutes. Shall I do this very last one? Seven minutes at last. Go for it. The, the very last slide, you can skip the ones in between. Go to the very last one, please, Nick. Go through all those, yes, quickly. Okay, this is the last slide. And Martin had asked me when we discussed this, talk about the history of your involvement with the Purple Emperor. Well, I knew that would take too long and that was not my main objective. My main objective was to get you interested in looking for the Purple Emperor and get to know the strategies of how to look for it. But this slide really summarizes very nicely what drives me, what motivates me, uh, as far as the Purple Emperor is concerned. It's from 1979. And what motivates me is getting to know people like yourselves, um, spreading the word about, getting people interested. Because the thing about the Purple Emperor is, it's quite elusive. You know, you can be in a wood for several hours where you know the Purple Emperor is, you can be there at the height of the season and not see one. The more pairs of eyes looking, the greater your chances of seeing one. So I like to get people interested. And, and this, this is one of the first examples of that. So um, this is a very small wood in North Buckinghamshire. Interestingly enough, at the top of the slide is the Silverstone Racing Circuit, which the top of the wood borders onto. Um, to the south of this little wood, you can't see it, is Stowe Public School. Um, and what I'm gonna do is read you, it takes seven minutes. I wrote a note from Switzerland in 1980, describing my experiences with this wood and the people attached to it. So I'll read, it, I'll read this to you. I had told several of my entomological friends in Buckinghamshire that I was interesting to find out whether Iris was still hanging on in the woods of Northwest Bucks straddling the North Ants border. Old records up to 1952 had indicated its presence there and the character of the woods seemed to be favorable. The last recorded sighting known to me was in the early 1950s in the grounds of a famous public school in the area. Sooner than I expected, John Manders of the Milton Keynes Natural History Society told me that an acquaintance of his, a Mr. David Dunham, had seen Iris on a pair of damp blue jeans hanging on the washing line in the garden of his sister's cottage during the 1977 flight season. And that's right, that's, that's where that cottage is. There's a couple of cottages there. So most of the trees here are mature oaks and ashes and sallow is fairly plentiful. The rides, the wide rides are cattle graze, so the turf is short, an essential feature since iris requires short turf or roads for its parading and skimming activities. Apart from the two cottages, there is a plant higher firm within the wood, just to the right, those white buildings. At first sight, this area seems too small to be capable of supporting iris, although it must be noted that it is surrounded on all sides by much larger woods, not more than one mile away. My first activity was to visit the area in the spring of 1978 and to speak to as many of the locals as possible. I also distributed butterfly conservations 
Purple Emperor Christmas cards to all and sundry to help them identify Iris. There is now no excuse for anyone in Northwest Bucks not knowing what Iris looks like. I was not able to visit the area during the 78 flight period, but to my delight, one of the ladies in one of the cottages, having remembered me telling her that this species has some interesting tastes, succeeded in attracting a male onto a matchstick, matchstick dipped in honey. Well, that was it for me. Two independent observations in successive seasons at the same spot by people who are not entomologists was too much of a coincidence. Iris was in North Bucks. The next step was to organize a search party for the 1979 season. One member of the party was a Mr. Ian Flinders of the North Ants Naturalist Trust. He knew the surrounding woods very well and in several years of looking had never seen Iris. The other members of the team were my original informant, John Manders, the first observer, David Dunham, Dunham and several members of the Milton Keynes Natural History Society. We arranged to meet one Sunday in late July. Unfortunately for us, the weather was poor. And although we spent several hours scouring this wood, um, all we saw were ringlets. Naturally, we were disappointed, but not downhearted. And all of us present at this meeting are, uh, are know that we can look for a particular butterfly and that failure and disappointment are part and parcel of our activities. But this makes success all the more sweet when it finally comes. Um, the weather improved and five days later I paid another visit. It was a warm sunny afternoon between five and six o'clock. I wandered from the southern end of the wide right through to the northern extremity of the wood, ever looking upwards at the crowns of the oaks. At the very narrow apex of the wood, near the southern end of Silverstone Race Circuit, I saw one specimen flying around the top of a very large oak and ash. Of course, the specimen was too far away for positive identification. However, and this is important, once you've seen Iris on the wing, there's no mistaking the characteristic flight pattern and habits. As soon as I arrived home that evening, I phoned Ian Flinders, who lived much closer to this spot than I did. The following day, it was very hot and he paid a visit, also late in the afternoon. He was even luckier than me. He saw a male on a tree stump not far from the master oak, so he got a good, good view of it. Subsequently, it was a question of trying to get a feel for the size of the colony here uh, and whether it was spread throughout this small wood. I visited the area five times during the next 14 days. Um, interesting, on one of these days, I decided to go very early at eight o'clock in order to catch the so-called matutinal flight as described by Heslop in his classical book. This is a pre-breakfast, low-level, inquisitive flight and is the only time of the day, according to this author, when one can be sure of finding iris at a low level. This is actually not true. You can find iris at a low level, ride skimming uh, throughout the morning on a good day. I positioned myself 20 yards from the master oak where I'd seen the butterfly above uh, a few days ago. In the middle of the ride, sat down and waited and waited. One and a half hours later, patience was rewarded. A male appeared flying around the base of the master oak's trunk where it alighted about two foot from the ground and I managed to get close enough to see that it was drinking from dew, which had trickled down the trunk. Um, I, I did have a camera with me, but um, I didn't have a flash and it was pretty dark under the canopy. So I, I, didn't, get a, I didn't get a shot, unfortunately. Um, on four subsequent visits, I saw Iris only one only once, but David Dunham in the cottage area further south, separately me during the same period, reported sightings around the cottages. Um, the following year, 1980 was just before we went to Switzerland and I was too busy and, and I didn't get there. Um, so I informed the Biological Records Center at Monk's Wood at the time, and they told me that this locality is the most northerly recently authenticated iris habitat. So I was quite, I was very happy. I thought I'd seen the most northerly iris in the country at that time, uh, 1979. Um, I don't know why Monkswood didn't have a record of the, um, of the southern Lincolnshire woods where iris was certainly there for a very long time. I'm not quite sure why that was the case. But anyway, this was before Fermin Wood. And so it was 
the, the official most northerly record. So, so that's it. Um, I wanted to end up by telling you how important it is to get to know people and get them interested in looking and telling them how to look. So thank you very much for your attention. It's been a long time. And I, I look forward to some questions. Dennis, thanks ever so much. That was fascinating, thank you. I've had a wonderful thought while you were talking and probably like one or two of my colleagues, I've uh, taken out an ordnance survey map and I've looked at Wellow Wood and Plumber and, um, and Sherwood Forest and I've traced woodland towards the South Yorkshire border. And um, again, historically, I, I, I think we all think that Maltby and Maltby Low Common and the woodland around it is probably as, as good an entry point into South Yorkshire as anywhere. And taking the example set at NEP in that uh, uh, during that July, I'm just wondering how many volunteers we could have camping at Maltby for a month, <laughs> looking out for uh, looking out for Iris. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Indeed, yeah. <laughs> I don't think uh, I don't think any one of us had enjoy it for a month, but uh, it's a wonderful thought. Uh, yeah, right, um, Dennis. Um, first question, and this is from. Where are we? Well, this is from Paul Dukes. He's saying, is there any evidence that uh, Iris may be using the M1 motorway in its verges, trees and plants uh, as, as access to Head North? Um, I don't know of any record from the, um, the border of the M1. I know about the M40, when it was built, it cut through a corner of the famous Burnwood Forest near Oxford. And um, because it runs through a forest, um, Iris is seen very close by. Um, I'm trying to think which forests the M1 runs through. Um, I tell you what, I know it runs through, because I'm familiar with it, it runs through forests in Northamptonshire um, where the butterfly is seen. So, you know, if, if you've got woodlands close to a motorway and, the, and there's banking and it's fairly wild, you have a very good chance. Okay, but I know, of, I know of no localities further north than that. We could deal with a few more questions if anybody's got anything to ask. In the meantime, I have, Danny. So have you done the same exercise as me and had look or had any thoughts about if the Purple Emperor does uh, end up in South Yorkshire, what avenue it would take to get there? Um, well, well, I think through North Nottinghamshire, since it's, um, as the crow flies, the sightings by Nick and Sam Brownlee in, Sher in the north end of Sherwood Forest are only 13 miles from the Yorkshire border. That's no distance at all. Um, I read an interesting article by an academic ecologist at York University in, in the last issue of, but of Butterfly. Um, and she's saying among other things that the comma is mo moving north at the rate of 10 kilometers a year, which is, which is quite fast. Um, I don't know if the Pope never moves so far, so I wouldn't be at all surprised, in which case 13 miles is no distance. And since it's all woodland, from the north end of Sherwood Forest to the Yorkshire border, I wouldn't be surprised. Coming back to Maltby Common, this is very interesting because I didn't ever get to meet Martin White before he died, but I exchanged emails with him. And uh, about a year before he died, 2018-19 um, or something like that, um, he told me he had released a large number of purple embryo larvae in Maltby Common. Um, he'd also released marsh fertility larvae there, but they never took. Um, so subsequently, I spent um, the next two years visiting Maltby Common three times in July, but I never saw a purple emperor. I think somebody has reported seeing one, 
but it looks to me as if his, his attempt at introduction in this case hasn't worked. But we shouldn't give up. You're quite right, Paul. Malt be common, malt be low common, and malt be high common are wonderful habitats and looked after by the Yorkshire Naturalist Trust, I believe, Yorkshire Wildlife Trust. Um, that they are, it is a wonderful habitat. So it's, it's worth spending time there. Okay. Um, question from Steve Kirkley. Hello, Steve. Um, shrimp paste can also help to attract male, male purple emperor to ground level. Have you heard that? Um, I've tried it. I haven't been successful, but certainly <laughs> lots of people are. Um, there's different types of shrimp paste. It's got to be fairly liquid. I think the mistake I made was just spreading fairly solid paste. But Matthew Oates has had a lot of success with it in Fermin Woods and other people have. So uh, it works. It seems to be the best bait available these okay. days. Thank you. Um, Sonia is asking, uh, looking through any prospective woods, do we need sallow to... Do we need sallow to find them? Yes, I'm sorry, I should have made that clear. Uh, the most important ingredient is sallow um, and lots of it, ideally. In the old books, you will read that um, broadleaf sallow, Salix capria or goat willow, to give it its old name, is favoured. And, and Matthew Oates has done a lot of research um, with sallow, looking at how many eggs and caterpillars he finds. And certainly broad-leaved uh, willow is favoured, but the female purple emperor will lay her eggs on any sort of willow. Um, and, it, and, and this is a tree. I'm not a botanist, but if you look in, in my particular plant and tree book, when I look up Salix, which is a generic name for willow, um, you will find 34 different varieties. It hybridizes like mad. And so you get leaves or of all sorts of width and shape. And the purple emperor will lay her eggs on, on all sorts of salad, but you've got to have lots of it. It's absolutely true that you need lots of sallow in your wood. And I apologize for not making that plain. So if you're investigating a wood in South Yorkshire um, to see if it contains the right ingredients, first and foremost, lots of sallow. Okay, thank you, thank you. A uh, few more, uh, this is Paul Millard. Is it established in the oak woods near Kings Lynn in North Norfolk? I'm aware of um, sporadic observations there from 12 years ago. As I would say when I lived in Switzerland, ich bin überfragt, which means I've been over questioned. I can't answer that. I, I don't know. I'm not very familiar with um, East Anglia. But what I do know from the distribution maps is that more and more are being seen in Norfolk and Suffolk. So it wouldn't surprise me at all. Okay, okay. Um, Colette's asking, is it likely that iris will establish in areas of rewilding? Do you know how long it took for them to take to a stronghold at NEP? I don't know how long it took. Um, his wife called Isabella Tree has yeah. written a wonderful book I'll tell you its title, I highly recommend it, about the whole project over the last 20 or 30 years. Um, let me tell you the title of her book. Uh, the author is Isabella Tree. She's the wife of Charlie Burrell, the owners. And it's called simply Wilding, the Return of Nature to a Farm. Wilding, the Return of Nature to a Farm, Isabella Tree. I'll send that an email to, to you, Paul and okay. Nick, so that you have it. But that's a wonderful book. It's not just about butterflies. They, they've done all sorts of things. Quite extraordinary. Um, they're seeing birds that they hadn't seen there for years, like the turtle dove, which I understand is not a very common species. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful place. So I, I recommend you go there. The thing is, it's become well known and popular. It's been publicized in the media. And nowadays, um, Matthew Oates runs safaris, which you have to pay for. He'll take you through, we'll take a group of people through NEP, um, looking at the Purple Emperors for about 20 quid. It's worth it. But you have to organize it. You can't just, I don't think you can just go there anymore. Um, you, you've got to announce yourself. But 
well worth it. Yeah, I've read that book, Dennis, and I, I would recommend it too. Oh, you know it, yeah. Um, I do, yeah. Um, right, that seems to be it with the questions. Um, thanks, every, well, I owe quite a few thanks here. Uh, thank you for so many, to so many people for turning up. Um, it's really been appreciated, and I hope you've found it, found it as interesting as I have. Um, can I just mention some future talks that are coming up? Uh, Andy Suggett from the Northeast is talking to us on the 31st in two weeks' time. Um, and this is something to do as well with what we've been listening to tonight, but it's looking at the wilder uh, effects of climate change on butterflies. And we could find that really interesting. Um, Dave Wainwright is talking to us on the 28th of February. Um, a very inter interesting concept regarding um, the moth conservation strategy for the county, um, which really should be li worth listening to. And finally, um, just arranged over the last 24 hours or so, um, on the 14th of March, um, Mark Collins will be talking about uh, British swallowtails. So um, you will keep those notes in your diary and have a think about them. Um, finally, Dennis, that was superb. I really, really enjoyed that. Thank you for doing this. Thank you for your time. I know it's been, uh, it's taken quite a lot of putting together this. And thank you though, in the way it's been so professionally done. Okay. Thank you for all your help and, and thank you for coming. I hope uh, lots of you will get out looking for Iris next summer. Well, there's a lots, lots of thanks coming through on the chat as well. So it's obviously gone down really, really well. Dennis, I was going to say, if you, um, just as a, an afterthought on there, I don't know whether I can share your screen at all, but I could show you, update you on Lincolnshire if you wanted. Oh, yes, please. Yes, please. I don't know, I don't know whether it's possible to share the screen, is it? Nick, is that possible, mate? I'm trying. I've just made it, Nick. I've just given it. Okay, more. thank you. Just John, see I, you John Matthew uh, reported that, that um, from from yourself that um, you've got localities north of Chambers Farmwood. Is that right? Uh, probably so. On there, I'll, I'll just uh, see if I can find the uh, share screen. Oh, here we go. This is the one I'm looking at. So I don't know whether you can see that at all. Yes, yes, we can see it. Yeah. Um, that that is uh, 20, 2020. Yeah. All right. And if I now go to this, what I've input input for this year. Oh wow! wow. So, Goodness. So there's a big increase this year. This, yeah. Uh, so so which is back, Chambers? Go back to 2020. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's a that's a big increase. So which is Chambers, John? Chambers is is sort of uh, around the middle here. Okay. Oh, and yeah. show show me the latest um, one again, please. Oh goodness. Well, we, now have, we now have some sort of sort of north of north of Chambers. In yeah. One of Chambers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean that. That is, that's very good to see. That's very good to see, I must say. And and the South Links Woods, how are these, they these are all the, These are all the Bourne, Bourne area. Okay, down, down yeah, here. around Bourne. Yeah, Mark, and, Mark, and, Mark, 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 Mockery Wood and Bourne Woods are, are really good ones for... Okay, and how long has Iris been known in, in these South Links Woods, John? How long? Um, quite a while, I think. I think I sent you a, a spreadsheet, didn't I, Dennis? Where they, where they go back to the uh, uh, well to the early 1900s yeah, to the early 1900s and they've been seen since then yeah. continuously now i wonder why monkswood biological record center in the late 70s didn't seem to know that hmm. anyway that's by the by but it's good that that really is a very exciting map you show there john thank you yeah. Excellent.
Can I ask you, John, uh, that that dot, which is far out, it looks like it's on the uh, Lincolnshire Wolds. Uh, I would have to have a look at you know where it was, but it, it could well be. Uh, but I, I'd, I can't remember one on the Wolds, actually, but... Uh, um, but I know there are there are woods uh, uh, to the west of uh, to, you know to the sort of east of uh, Chambers. I think where they're now uh, colonising. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, you... certainly, certainly, the, nearly all the woods surrounding Chambers have now started getting into lumber in them. So I mean, it's spreading out from Chambers. Yeah. This this confirms this does confirm the spread, doesn't it? Yeah. The natural spread of the butterfly. And um, I hope for Ken Orp's sake, we see it in Derbyshire soon. But it's interesting <laughs> that it seems to be concentrated in more or less the east of the country. Most of the habitats are in the east, of the, you know, from the middle of the country to the east. Um, it's, it's more or less absent from Devon and Cornwall, from Wales. Um, the theory is that it's too mild in the southwest. Um, for the hibernating caterpillar, it will wake up too often. Uh, but I don't know why it shouldn't be in Wales, you see. Certainly not mild in Wales. Um, but there you are. Uh, that's a mystery. It's, it's, not in, it's not in Cumbria, mm -hmm. in, in those good localities mm -hmm. in Cumbria. Um, it's not been seen there. It's Lake District, why not? That's a mystery. It's definitely it's doing best in, in the east of the country. You think weather's a factor, Dennis? Sorry? Do you, do you think weather is a major factor? Well, wet weather in particular. Yeah. Um, so when we compare, you know, kind of west, the western part of the country with our part, and, and particularly Lincolnshire and East Anglia, it's certainly wetter, isn't it? They have, yeah, on average, much more rainfall than we do. Um, so that could be a factor. I just don't know. And I, and Matthew Oates can't explain it either. Um, S certainly, in Devon and Cornwall, they think the mildness of the climate has a, a serious um, deletery influence on the caterpillar. I know uh, of a fairly well-known breeder down there. He moved down there and um, to his chagrin, the breeding didn't go too well because in the winter, his caterpillars were waking up. Um, so that, that, but that explains maybe Devon and Cornwall, but not not further north in the west. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a mystery still. Dennis, could you just give us a few tips on when in the Purple Emperor season is the best time to see them? And when, where can we find out when the season starts? Yeah, um, you've got to keep looking at Peter Eel's UK Butterflies site. site. And you've got to look at, um, because we all have access, don't we, to um, all the uh, local, the regional branch websites, don't we? So I go on to the branch websites and there you have the sightings, right? That's, that's the best way of doing it, I think. Um, the branch websites and, and start looking at that from mid-June onwards, because it's, it's getting earlier. The emergence has been getting earlier over the years. Um, in the old days, the 60s and 70s, um, you didn't look before. Classically, the 7th of July was the first time you would look. Nowadays, 7th of July is often well into the season, and um, third week in June is the best but it's been seen down south earlier than that. It's been seen from mid-June, mm. so, so it's got earlier. And it's what one blog to mention, obviously, is the Purple Empire, because that's where obviously a lot of the, uh, a lot yeah. of the ratings are talked about very early on, aren't they? So, yeah, yes, thank, yeah. thank you for mentioning that, Martin. Yes, that, that's absolutely right. That's probably the very best source of information. Um, so I haven't really answered the question, because further north it comes later. Um, <coughs> certainly in Willow Wood and Cockgrave, which are, um, you can rely on those places to see it, and now I think Sherwood, um, much before the middle of July, um, mid, late July is the best, but down south, the first two weeks in July are best, but up here, the second two weeks in July are best, from mid-July onwards. 
and time of day, Dennis? Yeah. When, again. when should we arrive? Okay. If it's a nice hot day like you experience, Nick, with your mates, um, if it's a nice hot day in July, then from 10 o'clock onwards, you'll see them. People have studied this. They've, they've got to their woods very early and, and, and noted when they first see a purple emperor on, on a hot day. And um, well, it can be 9.30, 9.30.10, if it's a nice hot day. Um, Matthew Oates, as I say, camps out in Nip and he's up very early in the morning. And, you know, it's statistics, isn't it? The more um, numbers of particular species that there are, the greater your chance of seeing one earlier than somebody else would in another wood. So, I mean, he's reporting them 8.30 in the morning in Nip on a hot day. Um, okay, that's, but you wouldn't see that in a normal wood, I don't think. So from 10 onwards on a hot July day, I think it's good. Um, and should we look up or should we look down? Aha, uh -huh. both, <laughs> both. I've, I've done damage to my neck. Um, my doctor <laughs> has, has told me that. I explained to him that I've spent the last, I don't know, 40 years in July craning my neck, looking upwards. And I've had a lot of neck pain. He said, well, that's the reason you're compressing the top two vertebrae of your spine for long periods. That's not a good thing to do. So um, I tried to limit that. <laughs> One of the crazy things you can do to avoid that is just lie on your back, you know, take, um, take a cushion with you and lie on your back and look up. Then you're not bending your neck, are you? or have a deck chair, and then you're not bending your neck so much. But that's a bit extreme, isn't it? Um, but you'll see them on the ground as well in a good wood. Um, in, in the first half of the morning, up to about one o'clock, if it's a hot day, you'll see males come to the ground. Um, but, you know, there are no rules. This is biology, isn't it? With all the variation you get in biology, you, you think you know that the purple member has specific habit habits but then you see that oh no it doesn't always just go on pieces it does go on flowers sometimes since that first photo i saw on self hill i've i've seen quite a few photos and records of um of the purple and on other flowers in but i like one from a few years ago in the chiltern hills near where i used to live um somebody living in a village at the bottom of the chiltern hills he had a female purple ember on his budley in his back garden, two days running. So, you know, that's the beauty of it. You don't know what to expect. Expect the unexpected, as Matthew would say. Expect uh, the unexpected. Nick, I, I notice it's two minutes to nine. Does, uh, does the meter run out precisely at nine? No. No, no. Okay, that's all right. <laughs> So, um, I mean, Matthew's book is brilliant because he's had so much experience and he's, he's seen so much. So what he writes, um, you can take as gospel more or less. Um, he really is very good. And his enthusiasm is, is very infectious. I don't see so much of him now, I'm up north, he doesn't. He doesn't, the furthest north he gets to is Fermin. But now that he's discovered Nep, he spends all his time there. Um, now what's, he's, he lives in a kind of tent. He used the word, which I'm ashamed to say I'd never heard of, but it's a common word. Yurt, J-U-R-T. Yes, a yurt, yes. That's a kind of tent, isn't it? Yeah, yeah it is. If it's, okay, a, big so one, if it's a big one, he'll have all mod cons. Okay, well, he, he hires one out There's a, um, in the middle of the wood. There's a, there's a kind of little headquarters, which is a, a hut. And there are a few of these yurts, ar yurts around. And uh, he, he lives in that um, more or less throughout July and spends about eight hours at least um, watching the Purple Emperor. So the more that you see, of course, the more knowledge you accumulate about its habits, um, which allows you... Uh, it gives you more success when you when you look for it, you know, when and, and how to look. Could you give us any tips on, you'll see lots of, quite often see white aperils, red aperils. Can you give us any tips of identifying 
which is which just flew over your head yeah that's a question you said would be asked and it's a good question i'm surprised you know when i said i saw that first one above that oak tree in stowe woods how did you know it was a purple emperor and i didn't have much experience by then i'd only seen it for the first time the previous year 1978 um but the only answer i can give you nick is that you have to see a few you have to see a few in flight and you have to see silver wash fritillaries in flight which i'm i'm sure you have and red admirals in flight and white admirals and now the three that you could confuse it with um but once you've seen all of them in flight a few times um you you get to know oh that's a purple emperor not silver wash fritillary the way it flies um all those three will go go up high um but not none of them really will spend a lot of time right at the tops of the trees flying above the trees across canopy gaps you know the, in my experience the red admiral does fly high and very powerfully doesn't it and it's as big as the purple emperor but it doesn't really go right high up above the trees it flies through the trees past them quite high but not at the crowns and not staying around the trees as the purple emperor um, stays around it stays around its territory but the red admiral doesn't and neither does the silver wash artillery now i've made mistakes in the past certainly with silver wash artillery because it also has kind of angular wings and it's big like the purple emperor and if it's silhouetted and you can't see the colors um i've made a mistake and that's when it's good to be with an experienced person uh, they'll say no no that's a silver wash artillery and it's always good to go out with several people. Um, but there's no substitute for experience, Nick. Um, I, there's no rules about um, telling somebody, yeah, well, this is how the Purple Emperor flies, and this is the, its wing shape, and that's how it's different from a silver wash artillery. No, because that won't help the people to be sure that they're seeing a Purple Emperor. They've got to have seen several, and all those four species they got to have seen flying, and then they'll know. I mean, Matthew writes about it in his book quite well. What's the uh, birder's expression for flight patterns? Jizz or something, isn't it? They've got a word for it, haven't they? Jizz. Yeah. Jizz. Okay. Jizz. It, so you, you, um, you, you've got to um, get the experience of that. It's not easy. It takes time. Does it glide like a silver wash? I just saw a lady ask. Um, yes, it does. It glides across the canopy gap in a very ele elegant fashion. And that's why you can confuse it with a silver washed. But I would say that the silver wash doesn't hang around particular treetops. It flies down a ride through the trees and carries on. Whereas the purple emperor tends to stay within a group of trees. That for me is quite a big difference. It's, it's very territorial, the male purple emperor, very territorial. Whereas those other species, as far as I know, are not territorial at all. Neither is the white admiral. I don't know if you noticed earlier, Dennis, but there was a message from uh, your, your friend, Mr. Brownlee. I missed it. Uh, he, he, he was telling us that the uh, emergence last year, the earliest, was 12th of July. Okay, yeah, that's that's pretty early for up north. Yeah. That's pretty early. Yeah, he, I mean, he's done fantastic things. He was, for instance, he also managed to get one of the uh, main wardens of the RSBB very interested. And um, he was able to be with this guy when a chrysalis hatched, a purple amber chrysalis hatched on a rainy day. And that's the best way to catch somebody and, and get them obsessed. And to have a senior warden, the RSPB on your side in a big forest like Sherwood Forest is, is so important. So that's, that's a real success, a real success. Have your colleagues looked through Clumber? Sorry? Have your colleagues had a look at Clumber Park? Sorry, I didn't get that last word. Um, sorry, have, have your uh, uh, committee members on, or any branch member looked at Clumber in any depth? Um, Clumber Park. 
Oh, uh, that's interesting. I've inquired about that. I've even um, emailed with the ranger there, who's very pleasant, and he told me there's not much, um, there's not an awful lot of sallow there except down by the lake. Now, I've never been there, but um, Nick Brownlee has walked through there with his wife, Sam, and they don't find it very satisfactory. Yeah, but that, uh, that yeah. are you still yeah. there, Nick? Is he yes, still he is. there? Yes. Okay, yes. so he, he knows it. Um, the thing is that um, sighting a bit further north along the road there, I can't remember what the name of which road it is, Nick will know, near the hotel there, there's a hotel, Clumber Park yes. Hotel. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well it was seen near there and photographed, and, and that, if you like, is the Clumber Park area, but it all kind of runs into Sherwood, so the Purple Emperor will, I imagine, fly through there, but if there's not much sallow, then you can't expect to see it, but there are old records. I can't remember who told me. There are old records from Clumber Park. Um, but where Nick and Sam have seen it, Budby South Forest, on the southern edge of the Budby Heath there, is obviously, um, if you like, the centre of the population because they have looked in other parts. I mean, it's a huge forest, very hard to research all of it. But in time, Nick and Sam will see the whole of Sherwood Forest, and I hope other people will as well. Um, to see if there are any other localities where you might find it. I'm interested in, indeed, I'm interested in Clumber Park and the area um, north of where Nick and Sam work, up to the Yorkshire border. Um, I want to see it in the woods between Worksop and the northern end of Sherwood Forest. Mm. And that's what I want, and I want, I want people to look. Because <laughs> that's closer to me, of course, that would be nice. It's, it's funny, when I moved up here, Matthew Oates was interested and he obviously looked at maps and he said, Dennis, I've looked at the maps of Sheffield. It's a very green city. Uh, there are woods. I've looked at Eccleshall Wood quite near you. I'm sure the Purple Ember should be there. Well, of course it isn't yet, but it might be. There's plenty of sallow here. Um, that would be ideal, you know, like I used to have when I lived in Switzerland, only a, a five minutes drive from my iris wood. That's, that's paradise, that is. Because if you're close to a wood, you have, you have the opportunity to really research what's going on. But I'm too far away from Sherwood. Um, and I'm glad that Nick and Sam uh, are spending so much time there. Okay, thanks. Shall we call it a day, guys? There are nods. Dennis, thanks ever so much. I, I enjoyed um, it immensely. You, you can watch, you'll, you'll be able to watch yourself on YouTube. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Which is something I should have mentioned earlier. Okay. Okay. I look forward to that. My and, wife uh, is my best critic, and she hasn't criticised me yet, so that's, that's promising. <laughs> well, you might get well, I, the internet now for saying that publicly. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who just said they'll look, keep their eyes open in Eccles, Eccles Award? Somebody did. Who's uh, that? A guy called Paul Cross. Paul Cross. Paul, Paul, do you live in Sheffield? Well, he obviously Don't, lives in Sheffield. Paul, do you want to unmute? Hi, I think I've unmuted. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I live in Sheffield. I live on the south side. Um, at Mearsbrook near Sheffield United football ground, but I go walking in Eccles or Woods quite regularly. Okay, so we'll, we'll have to meet. We'll have to meet each other then next summer. Yeah, we, yeah. we can arrange something over summer. That'd be great. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay. Yeah. Super. Yeah. Super. That'd Paul be great. Simmons. Thank you. Okay, I've noted Paul Simmons. Paul, Paul Cross. Paul Cross. Sorry, See, Paul Cross. Right. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Okay, excellent. You're, you're a member of Yorkshire branch? Yeah, well, I, I will be soon <laughs> after this. Okay, yeah. Oh, thanks. Okay. <laughs> excellent. Well, if, you, if you've enjoyed it, Paul, get in touch with the branch. Uh, you've got Nick's name up there, or mine, or Martin. Um, 
you know, we more than likely will be putting out search parties this year. That, that'd be great. I'd love to get involved. Okay, mate. Thank you. Okay, cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Paul and Nick, very much for making it run so smoothly. I appreciate that. And thank you, Dennis. Right. I've got to turn this off. <laughs> I'm going to stop the recording now. So. Okay. Great. Thank you, Martin. Thank no you for suggesting it. No problem at all.